Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, this is a really exciting um, conversation we're going to be having and one that I've wanted to have for quite some time. Um, so I think I'll start off by just explaining to you what motivated me to participate in this panel today. Um, and then each of our speakers will speak for a few minutes and um, we'll have a brief discussion and we'll finish with some questions from the audience. So anything you'd like to ask, please do. Um, so the question that I want to address today is basically why is Cambridge so far behind when it comes to conversations about sexism? Um, while other universities are talking about intersectionality and exclusion and inclusion in a much broader sense, at Cambridge the admission of women into the university is still a recent collective memory. Um, Maudlin, noted for its well-regarded candle lit formal hall and very traditional way of doing things, um, was also famously the last of the colleges to admit women um, as late as 1988. And even as that happened, um, its members wore black armbands in protest and carried coffins around the city. Um, I've often heard this story recited here and have watched as people reacted appropriately shocked and then returned their attention to the impressive buildings on their punt tours. But why is it so shocking? It's shocking because it shows just how resistant this university's colleges have been to social progress. It shows how tradition can be leveraged as a counter argument to what is right, how it can breed hate, superiority and exclusion in order to keep the already privileged elite comfortable. Comfort will have to be sacrificed. I was at a dinner at Maudlin not too long ago, sitting beside one of its senior members who shall remain anonymous. When I asked him for his views on why Maudlin was the last of the colleges to accept women, he didn't really have an answer. He did, however, find himself able to defend the principle of single sex colleges. Just as there are single sex schools, he said, the college had opted to admit boys only. Studies had shown, he told me, that boys focused better in the absence of female distraction. <laughs> this man, who undoubtedly had never been denied access to education himself, was blind to the power structure that this policy perpetuates. Blind to the plight of people who had grown up in ways other than, than himself and his closed circle. We also happened to be sitting um, that night um, besides the portrait of one of Maudlin's um, honorary fellows, Nelson Mandela. I decided in the heat of the moment to ask this man what he thought the anti-apartheid revolutionary would have thought about the policy and also how he'd feel about being associated with a college whose members still actively defend sexist and racist policies of exclusion. Perhaps not the most diplomatic question <laughs> to be raising in that moment, but some things are more important than the atmosphere at a dinner table. And the point is that hanging a portrait of Nelson Mandela on the wall doesn't automatically bestow all round wokeness or even humaneness on the members of the college. When the people in power are still blind to the power imbalances that keep them where they are, any changes, symbolic or even policy changes, will only paper over the cracks. It's not only about the history we put up on the walls, but about how we relate to that history and how it animates us now. So in that spirit, uh, this discussion today is about exploring what has actually changed. What changes cover still shaky foundations and what progress is real, because there has obviously been real progress too. What are the challenges we face in moving towards a more inclusive environment in the colleges and university wide? How are those different from those faced by other universities? And what can we learn from other places about how to move forward? So our first speaker will be speaking about women in Cambridge um, from a historical perspective. Um, ben, I think we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, 150 years ago, Cambridge blazed a trail. 150 years ago, my college, Girton College, opened its doors for the first time, and it was the first institution in the UK to offer the same residential higher education to women that had previously only been available to men. 
For the first time, women could get the same university education as men. For the first time, there were academic jobs for women in a UK university. Of course, Newnham followed shortly after that. So the interesting thing we have to think about is Cambridge was the first mm. and then fell behind and was overtaken by others because, of course, Cambridge was the last university in the UK to offer women degrees in 1948. Even then, according to the university statutes, there was a quota on the number of women that the university would admit. Cap first at 10%, then 20%. The cap was eventually abandoned in 1960. But the provision in the statutes wasn't removed until 1987. The exhibition that Lucy Delap and I have been curating at the University Library, The Rising Tide, um, has had to try and make some sense of this. And our starting point was to recognise that the university that Emily Davis tried to get women to join in 1869 when she founded Girton College isn't the university that we know. And I think there's a real danger when talking about Cambridge that the idea of tradition looms too large because the university has transformed itself out of all recognition in the last 150 years. And the interesting question we have to face is, how is it that sexual inequality has persisted despite the fact that the university has turned itself inside out and upside down in that time? If you think about what the university was like in 1850, you could only graduate if you were a member of the Church of England. College fellowships were restricted to members of the Church of England, as was membership of the University Senate. In 1840, 67% of Cambridge graduates went into careers in the church. The university was effectively an Anglican seminary. In 1850, the only honours degrees you could study in Cambridge were maths and classics. Girton College is six years older than the history degree. So, in the last 150 years, not only what you can study at Cambridge has changed, the idea of what a university is for has changed. The idea of what a college is for has changed. Interesting that women were admitted to the university long before they were admitted to the previously men's colleges. Um, there's a great letter in the exhibition um, from the Women's Freedom League to Sir Winston Churchill when they heard that um, a Cambridge college was being built in honour of Churchill. They wrote, say, you are going to admit women, aren't you? And we've got a letter from Churchill saying, what a good idea. <laughs> What you don't see, because we didn't have space to display it all, is the flurry of correspondence as trustees of the college mobilised behind the scenes to try and change Sir Winston's mind. And uh, one of Churchill's close friends, John Colville, wrote to him to say that the university has already swallowed a number of revolutionary propositions, <laughs> like the idea of a college that would specialise in particular subjects. Asking them to accept a co-educational college, he said, would be like detonating a hydrogen bomb at the heart of the university. <laughs> so, the nature of a college has changed. The nature of the university has changed. A lot of this incidentally driven by the university's decision to appeal for state funding after the First World War. That, that was a big um, change. The system of departments and faculties that we know today is really a creation of the 1920s. When Girton was founded, most teaching in the university wasn't done by lecturers or professors. It was done by private coaches, privately hired by the students to take them through the exams. What happened after the 1860s was the colleges tried to take control of teaching back from the coaches. And then in the 1880s, the university tried to take control of teaching back from the colleges. The first university lecturers were hired in the 1880s. So all of a sudden, you have a new career path, a new professional academic career. Cambridge didn't start offering PhDs until 1919, remember. So the professionalisation of academia is actually quite a recent phenomenon. Um, and every time one of these changes took place, new decisions had to be made about who would be included, who would be excluded. So I think we need to move away from the idea that the university has always been a kind of solid, unchanging patriarchal monolith with women hammering on the doors being refused entry. The university is a really protean creature. It's changed shape repeatedly. And every time one of these transformations um, has taken place, patterns of inclusion and exclusion have been redrawn. And that's the story that we've tried to tell in the exhibition. Um, the hopeful thing, I hope, <laughs> is that institutions can change. Institutions have changed. Institutions change enormously. The central analytical problem is how is it that despite these changes, 
sexual inequality has persisted. And with that, I think I'm straying out of my time, so I should probably <laughs> wind up. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we'll move swiftly on to Sarah, who is going to speak, I believe, about changing trends in, in perceptions of gender and reproduction. Right, okay, well, um, thank you for those beautiful opening comments that really set out um, a set of paradoxes for us to consider. Um, it kind of fits with what I'd like to say. As a relatively recent um, member of the University of Cambridge, I came here in 2011, and I came at quite a senior level. Um, I, um, I confess when I first came here, having taught at, I don't know, four or five other universities, you know, I did see a lot of the same patterns of sexism that I'd seen at other places, but I did have to get a notebook. Um, to start <laughs> writing down some of the things that happened in meetings. Um, because I couldn't quite believe the number of times that I would suggest something and, you know, until a man said it, it wouldn't be taken seriously. Um, and um, and the, the number of times that, you know, I would be um, introduced as the chair of sociology and they would immediately turn to the man next to me and, you know, assume that they meant him. Um, but, um, I think the point that you're making that the university is, um, as you put it, a protean entity is quite important because, of course, the real riddle of gender is how much it changes at the same time that certain <coughs> of its features, <coughs> excuse me, um, don't. Um, so there, you know, there's a 20% pay gap here, a pay gap that, as um, in most universities, is is higher gender pay gap. Um, at the most senior level, 20%. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that really turns on the question of value, and I think in particular how women are perceived in relation to academic authority, in relation to intellectual authority, and the um, possession of knowledge and the ability to um, convey that knowledge authoritatively. Um, and, um, and so I think there is something sort of quite fundamentally gendered about what we might call the, the reproduction of authority. Um, there is a way in which the transmission of knowledge is understood as a kind of reproductive mechanism. The language that's used to talk about the dissemination of knowledge, for example, is um, about mastery. It's about a kind of gendered authority and the perception of that, which is how the knowledge is passed on, um, and to the extent that universities are very much organized around a kind of gendered reproduction of the possession of knowledge, which would be one way to describe the disciplines and the canons, um, there's something quite fundamental about the way in which gender structures the very work, the very lifeblood, you might say, of the academy, um, which is about knowledge production and knowledge sharing. Um, so I think probably until we're more conscious of that, until we can interrupt that more fundamentally, it will continue to be an issue. Um, it's certainly an issue for me in terms of um, training PhD students. Um, um, just today I had a PhD student um, describing some of the same things I've experienced of you know, presenting her work at a panel um, and at the reception afterwards, having the man who was next to her on the panel be assumed to be the author of the work, even though she was actually the author of the work. Um, that, that sort of problem is really part of the learning experience, I think, if you are um, a, 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 a female PhD student and trying to establish your authority can be one of the most significant things that you have to try and do. Um, so I, I think that matches one of the biggest challenges that Cambridge will face in the future, um, which is what all universities are going to be facing, which is how to diversify what um, authoritative possession and transmission of knowledge involves. Because there have to be um, a much wider range of people involved in solving the many problems that are facing us from making better batteries to solving the gender pay gap to um, challenging racism here at Cambridge to learning how to integrate the colonial history of this university with its future in a way that will acknowledge the important lessons to be learned from that history. And until all universities can 
take those lessons much more seriously, there won't be the ability to move forward on the many kinds of problems that we really, really need to work on, and those even include technical problems. I'll just conclude by saying that one of the most interesting shifts I've seen in funding bodies, research funding bodies, recently is what I call the team turn. And it's the turn away from the idea that um, brilliant, you know, um, conceptions of a problem come from an individual, from a sort of individual's brain, an individual genius, a sort of Nobel Prize type figure, um, and instead the view that, you know, really excellent ideas usually come from groups of people, from teams of people, from departments, from labs, from groups of people who are working together over time, not only to generate solutions to problems, but to define the problems in such a way that those solutions will reach a wider number of people. Because a lot of funding organizations are tired of spending millions and millions of pounds on ideas that may look brilliant and win a Nobel Prize, but don't actually reach anybody. Um, so until the university, I think, is able to change its understanding of who has the entitlement and the authority to possess and convey knowledge, until that is a less gendered um, undertaking, we will, I think, unfortunately, continue to see the university as a place where sexism is being reproduced. Thank you very much. Um, so now we'll move on to Teresa Mateau, who will talk about her experience of conducting consent workshops at the college. Thank you very much. Um, if I could just uh, comment on something that uh, Ben said, which um, I, I feel is very empowering, which is institutions change, and we are part of the University of Cambridge. So it's us, and so well done for organising this panel discussion. What I thought I'd do is make a few observations about my limited involvement in the consent workshops that have been run here for JCR. Is there anybody from JCR here? No, they've got other fish to fry, this is <laughs> I understand it. Um, okay, uh, so I, I was going to make a few observations about the consent workshop. I was then going to make a few observations about women uh, in Cambridge thinking about staff and um, fellows and academics, uh, putting that into a sort of slight, slightly broader societal context on some of the issues that have already been touched on, and end with a question uh, which I think has already been bubbling up. What can we do to ensure that the change that's already happened can happen much more rapidly so we achieve um, a university that's fit for the 21st century and the values that I suspect all of us in this room uh, hold dear in terms of um, diversity and uh, e equality and respect. So the consent workshops, um, I, I'm not an historian of these, but uh, what, what I uh, was able to retrieve was uh, newspaper articles in The Independent and The Guardian in 2014, uh, describing how uh, new undergraduates at Oxford and Cambridge were going to take part in what had been called consent workshops, following a number of surveys that had been conducted, some by um, the universities themselves and some by the NUS, reporting high rates of um, unwarranted uh, sexual uh, behaviour, including assaults in the student population. And as you'll all be aware, these surveys, are very often the response rates are very low, so in terms of the epidemiology, actually knowing the rates, we, we really don't know, but it's happening. So that, that much uh, we, we do know about. Um, so the idea was behind, or is, behind these, these workshops, and I just talk about this through the lens of Christ. Um, uh, JCR, so, so the idea is that the student body is very much involved in uh, running these workshops, but with the support of Kuzu. So I'm really sorry that uh, the yeah. officer from Kuzu isn't here. So Kuzu uh, trains uh, members of, of JCR to run these workshops. They just last for an hour um, within the first couple of days of Freshers' Week. So the last, um, at the beginning of uh, Michaelmas term, there were eight members of JCR who were trained, and uh, half were men, half were women, 
mixed nationalities, mixed ethnicities. So actually, that was sort of wonderful in terms of reflecting diversity. And uh, my role is to represent and underscore how much uh, SCR it really uh, places a huge value on these workshops. They're called consent workshops, but I think it's uh, part of a broader agenda of respect. And say so that's part of my role when I just talk at the introduction of, of, of the workshop, to remind students that while they might be talking about consent in the context of sexual relationships, actually it is important to think about this in terms of respect in one's academic work as well as social relationships. It's how to listen and respect diversity of views, which is absolutely essential in all walks of life. Um, so in, in the last round of the consent workshops, I, I meet with the uh, JCR, uh, JCR officers after they've had their training from QC. We then have a good discussion uh, uh, in terms of what what the goals are that they want to get out of the, uh, of the consent workshop. Um, in fact, all they have is 45 minutes, so those eight work in pairs with a quarter of the, uh, of the freshers each. Um, we talked for five minutes at the beginning just to set the context, and I then debriefed the JCR members afterwards. And actually, um, it's incredibly powerful, um, and uh, the, the JCR officers who were involved in it do a brilliant job in what I would say is starting a conversation. That's all it's doing. And, well, not all that it's doing, but that's a very important thing to be doing. Um, it feels like it's important and it's a positive initiative to prevent the high rates of harassment and um, sexual uh, misconduct within the university. Uh, how it's evaluated, I've no idea but it's just one of a range of initiatives that some of you might be aware of that were um, started in 2017 in the university called Breaking the Silence. <coughs> Who has heard of Breaking the Silence? Um, I can't see, I think that's probably, if you haven't, uh, yeah, uh, well, I went to ask those who haven't. So it's maybe about 50%, uh, which isn't bad, but in terms of what the VC wanted when he set this up, uh, in, in 2017, it's not um, as, as uh, it's not 100%. So maybe we could send around, uh, MCR could send around a note so everybody is aware of that, um, that uh, initiative. It's, it's a really important initiative and a part of that involves the training for the consent workshops. So um, I just want to make a couple of points before I end. Um, We've talked about uh, sexual inequality within the university, um, and I've been talking about uh, the student experience, but uh, inequality exists elsewhere, thinking about staff and um, uh, academic and non-academic uh, members of the university. Uh, we've, uh, Sarah's already men mentioned the gender pay gap. Um, the last figures show it as being 20%. It's an important thing to realise there is that's lumping together everybody who's employed and it largely reflects the fact that there are more men in the senior, more highly paid grades than there are um, uh, with, with more women being at the lower paid grades. But within each of the grades, there's still a gap in the pay. Um, and uh, market supplements, uh, 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 sorry, uh, before I leave that, um, <coughs> since uh, 2008, the gender pay gap has been uh, getting smaller, um, as I recall, and again we can send around a link. In 2008, the gender pay gap was 24% in the University of Cambridge. It's now down to 20% in 10 years. Not bad, um, but uh, <laughs> come on, come on, guys. <laughs> um, and the other, the other uh, point to, to make, I was just mentioning market supplements to, to uh, people's salaries. Um, those have not been going in the right direction, so men are more likely to have those, and the gap between the market supplements that a, that a, that a, a male member of the university gets is larger than that of the female. So, uh, yeah, some, some, some progress, but uh, not everything going in the right direction. Um, 
The other thing to mention about uh, the wider culture, some of you might have seen that there was a survey recently uh, that was in the national press about rates of bullying and harassment within the University of Cambridge. Again, you know, the response rates aren't great, but uh, around, it's estimated about 20% of staff overrepresented are women uh, of those who are reporting bullying and harassment. Not great. So I end with the question. The university has made much progress uh, in uh, gender equality, as we heard from the beginning. And I'd like to say that Christ, uh, in the form of our master, uh, our first female master, here with us this evening, uh, <laughs> in 500 years. Uh, thank you, Exhibit A. <laughs> um, and in fact, with the most recent appointment, I think that now there are more female heads of house the male. I think it's 16 out of 31. Is that right, Jane? Yes. Yep. And uh, even Trinity has... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's related to us. <laughs> um, so, there has been progress, but uh, there is much to be done. Uh, how can we build on what's been achieved and go much faster? So, I think that that is really the question behind this panel. So. Definitely. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, and finally, Yasmina will speak about how her participation in um, a very uh, important uh, portrait competition that was held here um, last year, but also, I believe, about her wider participation in, in the universe. Hopefully, yes. I mean, okay, so, so I guess I've, I've been asked to be on the panel to try to present the positive changes that have been happening at Cambridge. Um, and um, I also want to start by saying that the biggest positive change and the, the, the real initiative that started this conversation about the representation of women at Cambridge and especially at Christ um, was uh, Professor Carrie Vaught, who is unable to be here with us today. So I'm going to try to also speak um, about the initiative itself. Um, and so the portrait, the Lady Margaret portrait competition was um, held uh, last year um, to sort of mark 40 years of women at Christ. Um, and I was actually really excited to be at the college while that year was uh, happening because I also had the chance to participate later in the summer in the 40 year um, alumni celebration. Uh, but the point of the portrait competition was to sort of challenge the uh, sort of overwhelmingly male representations um, and especially in the dining halls and the spaces of the college. And so um, Carrie's idea was to open up a competition to the student body um, to create modern or new representations of Lady Margaret Beaufort, who is the foundress and the patron of the college. Um, and, and I think in many ways what you were talking about, which is the idea of intersectionality, uh, was sort of what drove my um, my entry and the fact that they selected it even though um, the other entry was um, in terms of artistic uh, prowess I think much of much higher uh, <laughs> standard than mine this beautiful portrait that Emil um, painted um, I think that the reason that mine was also selected was that it was making a comment beyond simply the representation of just women. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I just happened to have these amazing friends in the college. And I, was, and I was thinking about also my own kind of position within this college because it was very close to when I first had joined Christ and I was feeling that Cambridge in, in general was so different from the background that I'm from. Um, and so in a way this was an attempt to also find my own place within this uh, like very diverse uh, international student body. Um, and then, I mean, so the particulars of the portraits is that I asked each one of my friends, including Marita, <laughs> which you can see <laughs> up there, um, instead of the Bible, to bring a book that had a specific significance to their PhD, sort of to break away from the uh, representation of Lady Margaret as this pious woman, um, and to rather say that women today are being appreciated and 
valued for their knowledge and um, you know their their position within academia. Um, and then the rather than the sort of religious white kind of thing um, cover that Lady Margaret usually has, this was more of a comment on the colonial history of Cambridge. And so I had these Indian uh, scarves <laughs> that are colorful. Um, and I asked each one of my friends to put them on. Um, so I mean, I, I guess what I, what, I, what I feel is that the fact that this was chosen um, reflects also a sort of more aw like awareness and acceptance of the fact that these things can be discussed today in the college and at Cambridge. Um, and so, I mean, I, I feel like that's already a very positive kind of uh, step for the college and then especially the rehang that has been done since this competition um, reflects the desire of the college to sort of move forward from the typical representations of uh, specific male figures. Um, so even the choice of the current male figures that are hanging in the hall uh, went through um, many discussions because I'm also on the on the um, the committee of visual arts, and so the discussion was also about trying to uh, select male figures that historically were supportive of women or had participated in some way or another um, in helping women be part of Christ. Um, whilst we wait for <laughs> the portrait of our master <laughs> to, <laughs> to be completed. Um, so I guess that's about the portrait competition. Um, and then I guess just as um, the MCR president, um, I think that there has also been a lot of positive changes in terms of just the student body. Um, I, I do feel that the JCR and the MCR um, are very aware, sort of uh, almost militant kind of spaces and that the students and the, and the younger generation are very much involved in these kinds of conversations. Um, and so testament to that, the last, I think, three MCR presidents have been women. Um, and of course, Emma, our women's officer, putting together this great panel. Um, and Marika, who used to be the women's officer also two years ago, um, and starting Sourdough, the podcast. So I think that there are many positive changes, but of course, it's just long and slow. Great, thanks so much for that and for all of these very interesting and important perspectives. Um, and it, it struck me while listening to all of you that perhaps also for our audience um, who aren't at Cambridge University, it would be worth um, discussing the, the college system we have here because the, the university is, is where we go for our, our lectures and is where we sort of participate in, in the academic side of life here. And colleges are supposed to be our more domestic kind of community um, of friends uh, and a support network. And I, I just thought that you know, we're talking about how um, the university has changed, how knowledge is very much gendered. Um, how do you think that this, um, this kind of opposition between the university and the, and the college plays into that? Do you think that the uni Cambridge University is, is different from others or that this system presents different challenges because we, are, we separate so, so strongly between academic and, and kind of domestic life. Who would like to speak to that? Well, I'm not sure the distinction between the university <coughs> and the college maps very easily onto a domestic versus academic distinction. One of the interesting things about the gender pay gap is that there are large numbers of academics employed by the colleges and not by the university on completely different pay scales with completely different remuneration packages. And I don't know if it's still the case, but certainly a very high proportion of college lecturers were women, and that's going to show up there. And I mean, to pick up um, on something uh, that you said earlier, of course, the colleges are also places of employment for large numbers of women working as non-academic staff. It's interesting that you started with Maudlin because um, one of the things we've got in an exhibition is an extraordinary portrait of a long dress from Magdalen College in the 18th century. 
And we have no idea why Magdalen decided to commission a portrait of a laundress in the 18th century. Um, we've also got a, a letter from a prospective student asking about you know, what they need to bring with him when he came up to Cambridge. And the response from the college is, oh, you'll have to ask Mrs. Wilson. She's been here for ages. And she was one of the bedders, one of the bed makers. Um, so for a lot of women in the university, the colleges are employers both for academic and non-academic staff. And I think that complicates kind of the student perspective on the university student distinction. And uh, the short answer to your question is, I don't think the university is very good at thinking that. I think there's a lot more that mm. could be done yep. um, to tackle some of the inequities that develop from the collegiate system. Could I also pick up on your question in that, um, I did, were, you, were you an undergraduate here? Uh, no, a master's student, but not okay. an undergraduate. So for yeah. undergraduates, I don't think that split, I think that a split applies much more for the graduate students, but for the undergraduates, um, the colleges uh, are, are part of their intellectual space with supervisions being organised through sure. the colleges. Yeah. And um, as Ben has just said, there will be some academic staff also employed solely uh, in a college as well as many of us who would be paid both by college and by um, the, the, the departments. I think one way, just thinking about um, sexual harassment and misconduct, um, one of the reasons that uh, Cambridge and Oxford were the first to set up these consent workshops is because the fact that students live in these relatively small communities has uh, uh, and also um, who who, uh, who tend to be the dominant students, that it, uh, it it becomes very difficult for some students where there has been a serious violation to suddenly find yourself mm. in very close proximity uh, to that person by being in the same college. And that is recognised as something that it's not exclusive uh, to Oxford and Cambridge, but it's it's, it's one of the things that yeah. sort of can make it slightly difficult. I mean, Sarah, go ahead. I mean, for for me, I think I understand what you're trying to say because it seems, at least, uh, to someone coming in as an outsider, as a graduate student, not coming from such a background, especially not being British and not mm. really understanding the. Uh, dynamics of class actually that animate a place like Cambridge. Um, the college seems to be different from the university because it's also much more resistant to change because it's much, it, it has a certain tradition to preserve. And I think this notion that yes, in the past the laundress were the only potentially female uh, females allowed in the college, but that's also then a question of class, right? It wasn't the elite women that were allowed. I mean, we. We even have that in this college, like Lady Margaret could only peep from her <laughs> lodge into the spaces uh, where um, female servants might have been allowed. Um, so I think that also complicates the questions of um, you know, who's allowed where, and historically and today, and, and how can the colleges be at the same kind of rate of moving forward as the university that doesn't necessarily have the same traditions that it's attached to. Completely, yes. I mean, I, I think um, it's, um, I and mean, we all know hospitality is very complicated when you want to make someone feel comfortable in their home, you know, um, but um, it might be that what you think is really comfortable in your home isn't actually so comfortable for someone else, um, and they might not feel very comfortable at all. Um, and I think not only Cambridge, but all the universities, in fact, all the institutions have to get much better at asking, you know, who isn't here and who feels comfortable here mm -hmm. and what's the relationship between the two. And that's an uncomfortable question. Um, it can be a very uncomfortable question. It can um, actually catalyze um, a lot of anger and... Um, hostility to even suggest that some people might not feel comfortable here or that there's a reason some people aren't here. Um, th those, I think, are some of the biggest questions that everybody's wrestling with right now um, as we look at the ways in which institutions have to become much more self-conscious of what they may unconsciously be doing 
to um, make <coughs> some people feel very much at home um, and other people feel <coughs> very unwelcome. Um, you know, it's, it's confusing when um, terms like microaggression are used because there's something fundamentally very disconcerting about entering into a room where you feel very uncomfortable. <coughs> you might not even be able to say why exactly you feel very uncomfortable or unwelcome, um, but it could well be that you're uncomfortable for very good reasons because you're actually not really supposed to be there or you're not expected to be there or you're not going to be recognized there or you're not going to be welcome there. Um, so yeah, I, I think the colleges do have a bigger challenge in some ways, because in some ways the most intense intellectual conversations happen in the college because people feel comfortable. But in other ways, certain things never happen in colleges because certain people would never feel comfortable being there. So um, yeah, it's a big challenge, but it's an exciting challenge. Um, and it's an intellectual challenge. It's not just a kind of emotional or psychological challenge. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a problem that needs solutions. And we're actually quite good at finding solutions here. It's one of the most protean aspects of Cambridge, um, that we have that intense vitality of liking difficult problems, or even my favorite, impossible problems. Um, and, um, and so that, that's definitely the most hopeful thing. But there's no way the problem is going to be solved until the seriousness of the problem is really fully appreciated. So how do you think we could move in that direction? How do we convey the seriousness of this issue and how do we connect these problems you know do people feel comfortable in the college do they feel comfortable at the university how do we start to sort of have a, a, a discussion that that crosses these these lines can we open up to yes ask? sure yeah um, <laughs> if anyone has any ideas <laughs> please feel free to raise your hand and someone will come and bring you a microphone yeah, over here. Hi, I've never spoken in the microphone Ooh. before, so I hope this is working. <laughs> and would you mind introducing yourself before you... Uh... Um, my name is Petra. I'm a history of art uh, at Paul student at Christ. And um, one thing that I think I was... When you were talking about consent workshops, it really reminded me of a conversation I had with um, some boys who are from, I'm originally from Croatia, who are from Croatia as well. And I think there's a certain level of perhaps disconnect between a presumption of a certain cultural background when you're talking about these kinds of measures. Because the way that I know a lot of boys from Croatia and Serbia and this kind of region see a lot of the kind of discussions that we're having right now is as almost a kind of colonialism where they will see them as cultural values that are not really their own, that are being imposed upon them. And I personally don't agree that you know, female equality should be seen as a cultural value, but um, I think it's interesting that they perceive it that way. And also that they perceive it as a kind of traditionally not, as a, an institution which has not traditionally been very open to uh, people from different backgrounds and, and women and all of these other groups that are now sort of ostensibly being prioritized. Um, and they sort of see it as a turnaround where the people who are really used to be worst at it are now lecturing them at being best at it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that, it's not really a question, it's more how you might deal with a situation like that. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that there's no one from JCR. Um, you, I did mention it was just um, uh, extraordinary, the array of um, backgrounds that those individuals came from, and I didn't say anything about the content of the workshop, but it would be uh, attempting to start those conversations, so it's, it's, um, it's not the nitty gritty of uh, consent or sexual, uh, starting sexual relationships, but it is going, being led by the students, and so if students want to, to, to raise that, but, but I think you, you, you're making a very important point that there is already a value system and um, we've articulated one here. Um, it's, it's, it's implicit and not everybody shares that. Um, in the very beautiful, 
prize-winning portrait that <laughs> Yasmina showed, the um, woman sitting at the front, Asya uh, Islam, who used to be a fellow in this college, is reading Judith Butler's book. And Judith Butler gave a lecture here three years ago on exactly that topic, which she called gender in translation. And she talked about how even in France, um, where the word gender has a slightly complicated translation genre, um, uh, the anglicized version of gender is itself used as a symbol of Anglo colonialism. Le gender, you know, means the expectation that, you know, um, gender equality will be the measure of civility, whereas in France, of course, we needn't think that way because, you know, um, we have Paris, you know. Um, and um, the reason for that is that colonialism was waged very much through the language of gender. Gender, sexuality, and reproduction were absolutely fundamental to the ways in which laws were imposed, colonial laws, all of the anti-sodomy laws were part of a colonial um, exercise. And so it's perfectly logical to associate the imposition of gender norms with a colonial form of power. And unless we understand how gender intersects with colonialism, with racism, with class, with knowledge production, with other kinds of institutional structures, of course we can't understand how gender works. Because, because as a reproductive system, gender is very complex. It's not just about men and women, it's about how the grammatical function of relationships is coded to represent nationalism, to represent ethnicity, to represent um, superiority to represent ethicality. When you enter Britain at the moment, of the three pictures you see to welcome you to the you know, progressive United Kingdom is a mixed race gay couple. You know, it's another example of how a certain kind of symbol of equality can also be used as a form of cultural superiority to negate the um, ways in which other societies understand things. And given that most of the anti-sodomy laws came from the British Empire, it's really ironic that Britain is now coding itself as you know, superior because it permits um, homosexuality. So it's, it's perfectly logical that gender would be seen as a kind of grammar that intersects with others. Um, and again, I think unless people are more sophisticated about understanding how gender works, those sorts of things are just going to be hard to interpret. Any other questions? Yep. Um, I just wanted to say that touching on from what going on from what Sarah said about intersectional feminism and so on, just in terms of um, making sure that the right that people get this sort of information, because if, without it we, we're unable to have this conversation in the first place. Just looking at. Um, this podcast itself, I think looking at the room, it's safe to say that it's there's more women than men. And even before that, I did have conversations with um, male members of the college and the university, and they did, for some some reason, feel as though this talk was not pertaining to them, or it was more of a female environment and a conversation only really open to females. Um, but going on from that, it's how do you, I mean, a podcast is one way, a new way that we can reach out people who might not feel comfortable attending sort of talks, but it's the question of how can we get this information to everybody, to a wider audience, regardless of, you know, class, race, um, gender, and um, whether or not they feel comfortable being in this room. Thank you. Well, any responses to that? I mean, how do we how do we make this not only a, it's not only a question, of course, about um, conveying this information to an audience who might not feel comfortable being here, but engaging them in discussion and, in fact, having them raise the questions that we discuss. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, thinking about how we get people to become invested you know, when they don't necessarily feel that it's their area of interest or it doesn't relate to them. And I think one of the things that can be quite powerful 
is getting groups of people together to look at the ways it impacts not just women, um, how it negatively impacts men. If you look at um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of the ways in which she made such strides within the law wasn't looking at how it affects women, how discriminative um, things affect women. She actually looked at how it impacted men. And then it kind of makes more people sit up and take notice and maybe invest the time in coming up with solutions to the problem. So I think that's something that can be done and um, something we can do collaboratively to come up with some, whether it's literature or you know people on the podcast, looking at the economic, academic, all of the different ways and socially how um, we will all progress if we all look at these issues. Hi, um, I'm Olivia. I am doing an MPhil in Education and Linguistics, um, and I'm also the Women's Officer at CATS, uh, which is that direction. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I started these um, equality discussion groups, um, and I was kind of reluctant at first because I was like, I don't know how they're going to go, I don't know if anyone's going to come. Um, and they've kind of gained momentum. Um, so, yeah, so the purpose of me starting these was kind of to create, um, I want to say a safe space, because I feel like safe spaces are used for women exclusively. Um, and only last week I had a conversation with a, with a girl who was like, I can't believe you do this, like, that's crazy, like, you should be having kind of feminist groups with women. And I was like, but that <laughs> doesn't make any sense, because if men are included in these discussions, then, they, that, then we can't make any progress, right? So. Um, but having said that, some of the issues have become, I, I feel like they've, <laughs> I don't know, it's difficult because I want to create the space that men and women can talk about the issue, you know, like men can talk about the town on tax and not feel awkward about it and you know, they can talk about concern and experiences of kind of equality and modern dating and stuff like that. Like some, those are some topics we've talked about, but to what extent are men really included in these conversations, right, like, can a man, there was actually a guy a couple of weeks ago, he tried to mansplain to a woman about statistics on, you know, apparently women don't actually get period pains, it's actually kind of, it's just the Monday morning blues and everyone gets it, but he was mansplaining <laughs> to her in this conversation, like, just, and she, but the, he didn't realise he was doing it, it was only when, after we kind of, had a chat to him after some wine and said like you and then he realised and he was mortified. So, you know, stuff like that I feel like that does make an impact. But yeah, my question was to what end should men be included in these discussions and is there anything we should just not let them <laughs> 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 Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for that. And I guess two very much related questions. So how do we in involve men in these conversations and how do we make a wider group of people realize that they have something at stake in these conversations? So what, what, what do we all think? Um, there are um, uh, a swing of men, and as my eyes are <laughs> um, I don't know uh, if any of them want to comment, uh, recognising that you are unrepresentative, uh, given that you, <laughs> you are here. But if any of you, if that intervention sparked any thoughts in your heads. Otherwise, we could ask the man on the panel. <laughs> Well, I, 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 my, my day job when I'm not co-curating exhibitions is that I, I work principally on the history of masculinity. And um, I wrote a book about how and why an all-male aunt responded to demands for women's rights. And that's sort of why I was asked to curate the exhibition, because thinking about how male-dominated institutions respond to demands for sexual equality is something that I, I've done a lot on. Um, so I have quite a lot invested in that. <laughs> um, in, in several senses. I do think understanding the history matters. And that's not just me trying to sell my book. Um, because I think one of the things that understanding the history can do is challenge the illusion of timeless permanence in our sense of what forms of behaviour and conduct 
are expected of men to understand that masculinity has changed over time. Um, there's a great letter from the Home Secretary in 1872, Henry Bruce, to his wife, where he says, I've just got your letter, quite agree with what you noticed um, about the new generation of MPs who've entered the House of Commons. Um, I agree with you, I can't account for it. Men do occasionally cry now, he said, but they dare not show it, being ashamed of it. Surely it is more manly to show your genuine feelings than to be ashamed of them. And what he'd noticed was that the younger generation of men elected in the 1868 election um, had a different understanding of how men ought to behave than their elders. Those men had been socialised in the 1830s and made a wealth of cultural movements that accorded considerable importance to the expression of emotions. And I think part of engaging men in these discussions is not... I think there's a stereotype that where men think that Women want to tell them how to behave. And actually, an perhaps easier point of engagement is just to draw attention to the fact that the way that a particular group of men understand the nature of masculinity is a historically contingent formulation. It's not natural. It's not timeless. There are other ways of being a man. And we know that because other parts of the world do it differently, and other points in time have done this differently. And actually, it can be quite engaging, I think, for men to be confronted with behavior that to them makes no sense at all. That plants a seed. You know, it, it um, makes them realize that they are the product of a historically distinctive set of circumstances. So my way of playing a role in these conversations has been to try and get people thinking about history, which very happily, coincidentally, is what I get paid for. <laughs> um, but I do think it's a value. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way. Okay. And I, I, I would hope that that's something that, I mean, I, I keep talking about the exhibition because that's why I was invited here. Um, but I, I hope that's one thing we've done because the opposition to giving women degrees, for instance, in 1920 and 1921 didn't come from the academic staff. The majority of academic staff supported giving women degrees when it was voted on in the 1920s. The opposition came from the male undergraduates. And above all, from the former students, the um, MAs, because they're the ones who had the vote. In incidentally, that's why Oxford gave women degrees first, because Oxford MAs weren't able to vote. Um, you know, these men who had a very strong sense that you know, a college was uh, a space for the cultivation of particular kinds of masculinity. So by all means, educate women. But why do you have to educate them here? And the alternative put in December 1920 to giving women degrees was to create a separate university for women. Because educating women is fine, but what was at stake here was a particular form of elite masculinity. And Cambridge colleges were institutions for creating that. <coughs> so one way of perhaps challenging whatever residual traces of that sentiment remains is to point out that you know, masculinity is a fluid historical construct. OK. Sorry, I so the history, that's, that's one, oh yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, one one response. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other suggestions? M maybe from the audience? What would be required for um, not just women to feel comfortable enough to participate in these discussions? What makes it feel important or relevant? I've been thinking about the responses. Could I come back to you? Sorry, I, I don't recall your name, but from uh, Cat's woman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you said that uh, they were um, e equality uh, discussions. Yeah. And um, uh, Yasmina mentioned other forms of equality and inequality, and thinking about class, ethnicity. Are, are those matters discussed, or is it focused on gender? inequality of the discussions, or do you go further um, than that? They're, so they're mainly kind of gender, so yeah. Mick almost was, it was every week we had a different topic. Um, so personal favourite was um, demystifying masculinity, um, and if you've heard of the man box, ending with in the man box, yeah, we kind of looked at that. Um, it was equal. Um, yeah, the topic, I try to, I try to make all the topics kind of gender-centred. Um, but I did sneak in, 
I suppose they kind of the foundation was kind of feminist theory and feminist insight, and I tried to kind of filter that through to the to the men because otherwise they just would have felt alienated. No one would have cut. Well, it would they would have cut. Just would have been women. Um, so I kind of had to trick them. Uh, <laughs> so it is it is gender based. So if I could just comment briefly, yeah. um, the woman um, to uh, just behind you to your right who is. Uh, uh, a budding applicant here. Um, you talked about making the case for how um, uh, everybody gains. It's a win-win. It's not just about improving things for women. And this is very much an approach that's been taken in the area of inequality. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, the book, The Spirit Level, which talks about how um, uh, wealth uh, inequality across societies um, affects not just those at the bottom, but also those across the spectrum, so everybody stands to win. Um, it, so it's, it's a neat uh, argument to make. Uh, we haven't won it in terms of uh, inequalities of wealth or, or health yet, but I, I just thought that was an interesting uh, comment to make. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Like one further observation about St Catherine's, because uh, am I right in thinking that it's 40 years yeah. St. Catherine's admitted So actually within Cambridge, there are a number of anniversaries which yeah. could prompt ways of starting yeah. these conversations. Mm. I, I think Jesus as well are also celebrating the anniversary. You know, mm. I mean, those present opportunities. Yeah. Yep. Uh, not for a self-congratulatory pat on the back, but as ways of starting a conversation. Um, I, I'd be interested to know actually how much the students at some of the colleges know about the history of their own colleges and um, the struggles with women to those um, institutions. But I think that's a good way. Definitely, yeah. And I'd also just, while we're on, on the, the sort of topic of, of workshops, and I'd be interested to know in the context of your consent workshops, um, how those conversations as a rule have unfolded and who participated in those conversations and what issues were raised. Um. So the workshops that have been run at Christ in the last three years, the first one that was run was held in here and um, mainly led by the uh, women's officer from, from Kuzu uh, with JCR officers and myself uh, with a hundred or more uh, freshers. Uh, which uh, and we don't do it like that anymore. We divide up into to the small groups. But I was terribly impressed by the way that the QZ officer and the JCR, the two JCR um, representatives, were able to create a, a, a safe environment. And I would say that possibly about 30% of the students spoke. So you think you're a fresher? You, you know, this is the first, you've only just arrived and. I, I, uh, what particularly uh, sticks in my mind is uh, a male undergraduate who must be about 18 who talked about anxiety about being a virgin and what that was like. Um, uh, so it was. So uh, we don't do it like that anymore. But but uh, it, it is possible to do it in, in, in a large space. Yep. Um, uh, but now I don't sit in on the groups because okay. power mm. imbalance. And so I'm just supporting the JCR students who had the conversation. And as I say, it, they're 45 minute small groups and what comes up is very much led by the students. And in the last round, I think in a couple of the groups, the participants, the, 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 the freshers clapped at the end. You know, they, were, they were just sort of really very, it was very, um, very student centered. So, so it ranges from uh, what we've already heard um, from, from Croatia in terms of, you know, this is sort of culturally, you know, absolutely not where I'm mm. at, to other other conversations that are much more yeah. specific. Brilliant. But, uh, I wanted to just also comment on what Petra was saying, and I, I think that I understand exactly like, the kind of dynamic that you're describing, because I'm from Lebanon, and I mean, we're not even potentially at the level where we are having these conversations even, potentially. Um, but I think that um, sort of what um, sorry, what's your name? Olivia. Olivia yeah. was saying. I think framing the issue as a conversation, as a so that because 
if in certain contexts men have been used to being in power, of course they're uncomfortable being attacked mm -hmm. because they feel that they're losing the power. Whereas if it's more of a conversation where, um, I mean, I know like most of my male friends who are Lebanese, it's not that they actively want to be part of the system, but if it's presented to them as an attack, then they're not really open to listening. Whereas if it's more of a conversation where you say, well, this makes me feel uncomfortable, I know you might mean it as a joke, then they might be more open to really listening to these things. So I do understand this kind of perspective of, oh, it's the colonizer coming to tell us about how to be civilized again. But I think that the pushback needs to be from us. It needs to be, well, I agree that that might have been the, that history, but I still feel uncomfortable because you're not treating me as an equal, because, etc. So of course it's up to us to sort of lead the kind of effort yep. until the point where maybe we'll be joined by the men mm. as well. <laughs> yeah. I think we're actually we're running out of time already, um, but I think we've raised some really important points today. Um, and I think that Yasmina's point is a great one to end on. I mean, taking responsibility in framing these discussions, including as many people as we can in those discussions, and to really take that challenge very seriously. So I think that's an amazing ending point. And thank you so much for all of um, your participation. And thanks for coming. Thank you.